Welcome back boys and girls. Today we're going to do something that I've been wanting to do myself for quite a long time and a lot of you have requested that I get my hands on one of these as well. Today we're going to take a look at the Holt Bladeworks Spectre. Here in this video, we're going to take a look at two different specters. I have one here and one inside of the pouch. And we're going to talk about how great the knives are. We're going to talk about how smooth they are, the killer action, the beautiful machining. We're going to talk about the, the specifications and all that kind of good stuff. But we're also going to talk a little bit about Joe and Angie, who own Holt Bladeworks, and some of Joe's philosophies as I've had a chance to kind of interview him and talk to him a little bit about the knives that he's making. And... I really, really, really am excited for the opportunity to do this. Before we go any further, I want to give a quick thank you to Alex Kahn. These are both his knives. Uh, he hooked up with me at the Blade Show in Atlanta a little over a month ago. Or about, actually, it's been about a month ago. And uh, he's he offered, he's like, I know you really dig their knives. I know that... Uh, a lot of people want you to do them. I want you to do them. I want people to see how great they are. I'm going to loan you my number one favorite EDC, which is the uh, the green guy here, and the other one that's in here that is brand spanking new. I don't even think he's even carried it. He's like, I really want to see a video on these. Please put this out there. Uh, Alex is a rather excitable young man, if you've never met him. Very excitable, kind of jittery. Uh, think of a chihuahua on crack cocaine. Yeah, that's that's Alex. But he, he's like us. He's really, really, really excited about high-end knives and the, the all the work and the beauty that goes into them. So thank you, Alex, for trusting me with your two babies. Now, after almost a month, I'll finally get the damn things boxed back up and shipped back to you. But now, let's start talking about the knives themselves. When we talk about all of the things that make this knife great, we've got to start with the basic specifications. So we're going to get that package out of the way real quick and just focus on the one knife. You're looking at a blade length of 3.6 inches and the thing is it doesn't it doesn't feel as big as it is. I mean I mean a three and a half inch blade really isn't that big to begin with. It just seems somehow more compact than that. Uh, you're looking at 61 Rockwell hardness on the steel and this particular version is M390. The handle's four and a half inches, and the overall length is 8.15 inches. And then it starts getting more confusing when you start looking at options. The milling options on the handles are going to be part of what you need to determine when you figure out which exact knife you want. There's pinstripes, satin pinstripes, starburst, moray, checkered, feather. I mean, there's all these different options that are available to you on all of these knives. Then, of course, the colors and then the hardware, if the hardware is going to be matching, if it's going to be offset. Oh, God, there's so many wonderful options. So let me show you two of them right now. So we've seen the teal. And this one, which is my personal favorite, is the purple. Oh, that purple. Oh. So what you've actually got are blues and magentas in there. It's hard to see. I don't know if... 
in my photography I was able to pick it up but I don't know if you can quite see it there we go you can see the magentas coming through as highlights uh, funny enough this is the exact configuration right here that when I spoke with Angie I said yeah I, I really want to buy one of your knives this I want this I want this purple this kind of fade to the different purples uh, that's my my personal choice that's my personal favorite so hopefully in the next year uh, that will be uh, in my collection I'm very very excited for that let's show you the packaging that you can expect this is the uh, the latest packaging so it's got the embroidered Holt blade works on there your individual knife number is going to be on a hang tag laser etched with the uh, specter and Holt logos there inside we have stickers because everybody loves stickers and then a personal thank you right there here is your I guess your th authenticity card I suppose that goes back in there I'm trying not to wrinkle this up since it's not mine and tells you about the adjustable detent system which yes is going to be important and we'll discuss that later and then the tool to make the adjustment so I know there are a lot of people that have a lot of questions and I think the the most burning question the uh, the syphilis of today's topic the most burning question wait the syphilis burner or is that gonorrhea I think that's gonorrhea anyway uh, <laughs> I get sidetracked the burning question for most people is when they look at these knives are they mid-tech are they custom are they semi-custom are they production and yes I am going to address that let's talk about the knives and and the story of uh, of Joe and Angie and then we're gonna make our way into it first off the Spectre is pretty much one of the it knives right now very hot everybody wants one everybody's talking about them a lot of people are collecting multiples whenever they can get their hands on them they're not easy to get oh, just perfection in every way with that action the reasons for this are numerous part of it's because the size I mean it's a really great easy to EDC size it doesn't feel too small to be wimpy though that's what's really cool yeah I'd like it to be just a tad bigger for my hands but that's fine I have plenty of knives in this size and plenty of uh, opportunities to carry them love the size overall it's very slim it's very lightweight very easy to carry it's got a very useful blade shape so it's going to be great for EDC another is the very fine machining that goes into each and every knife and also the dizzying array of the really vividly done colors is another good reason but honestly another reason is people have gotten to know Joe and Angie and well they're pretty damn lovable folks and many of us just like to support people that we like and so far pretty much everybody likes Joe and Angie they're really really nice people I had such a wonderful conversation uh, with both of them meeting them at the blade show and then afterwards a couple times with Angie and then uh, her passing forward all of the information I got from Joe now as far as the information I got from Joe he it was like I opened up Pandora's box he gave me way more information than most anybody is going to uh, really gonna need so what I've tried to do is condense it down a little bit I'm not really paraphrasing uh, what I'm gonna list out to you uh, the things that he mentioned are the things that he said first off the Spectre was Joe's first successful folder design up until around 2017 he was only making fixed blade knives and he went to blade show in 2016 uh, with the goal of buying a whole bunch of desert ironwood and some other really really nice materials uh, for some skinners and things that he was going to be making at that time and the thing is he played with so many beautiful knives at the blade show a lot of beautiful flippers he went you know what I really I really want to make a folder I really want to make a flipper 
But the problem is, every time that he had tried experimenting doing that with his, at the time, not so state of the art machines, he wasn't happy with the, the, the tolerances. So he just kind of gave up on it. And he figured, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out a way to do this. This isn't the right time. But after Blade Show 16, he went, no, uh, it's time to kick it into gear. And he spent his whole trip home coming up with this design. And it's obviously been, been refined several times since then. But he decided, now is the time. I'm going to make my folder, and I'm going to make a big investment. And it was a big investment. He decided to order a uh, Tormach CNC. And then his process began. And i got to realize, folks, buying a CNC is a really, really, really big decision. Even more so for someone like him, because at the time, he did not own a CNC. He did not understand or know CAD and CAM design. So he didn't know all the things that need to be done. So I have to give him huge credit for taking the time to teach himself CAD and CAM how to operate the CNC, which, by the way, he pretty much had to assemble because uh, they brought it into their basement. <laughs> and there was no way to get the whole machine down there. They had to tear it apart, bring it down piece by piece, and he had to figure out how to rebuild it. Man, that's big balls. But here's the thing. Um, he knew that he needed a CNC to get the precision that he wanted in order to make a knife like this. So he had to learn an entirely new skill set. The problem is, as things progressed and the demand grew, once the, uh, the first models came out, he was running that Tormach at 16 hours a day at maximum speed and blowing through a spindle about every six months, which is a hugely expensive uh, you know, kind of thing to have to go through. And also very inconvenient, and machines down and everything else. So he realized that wasn't going to cut it. So he upgraded to a Haas with more upgraded options that allowed for even greater precision and for more efficient output. And he's been able to run that pretty much around the clock. He took a lot of constructive feedback from people as he f started putting the first few models out. And he got to understand what people really, really wanted out of an EDC knife. He took that advice. He took those suggestions. He listened to friends. He listened to customers. And what you see before you is the most refined rendition of this model. He's done different detent styles, different lock styles, all kinds of different stuff. And this is the culmination of all of his efforts over the past uh, two years or three years now. Oh, man, just, just feeling that really is nice. And realize nobody should be closing their knife like you're seeing me do here and... We see a lot of people doing this on Instagram and stuff like that. It's, it's just my way of demonstrating to you how smooth the action is because you can't physically hold it and feel that yourself. Because when I'm closing it like a normal human being, it is so glass smooth, but I have no way to, to relay that to you. So by doing a little bit of a gravity shut on it, you can see there's... There's almost no friction whatsoever, and I'll explain to you why in just a couple of seconds. But first, the burning question everybody wants to know, is the Spectre a custom? Is it a mid-tech? Is it a semi-custom, or is it a production knife? I realize there's a lot of different ways you can look at all that. You can look at a full-on custom, like this Arucas Blumeris, that is a full handmade custom. Everything is done by Arucas, it's all done by hand, it's, it's beautiful and it's great. But then you have guys that are super ridiculously talented with their CNC. These two knives right here are both customs. But they're made with smart machines. They're made with CNCs. So that means it's every bit as custom as this, but instead of using a manual mill and files and things like that, they're using a CNC. They're still custom making the knife. They're still being made by one person, everything in-house. Whether it's done on a CNC or it's done with a hacksaw and sandpaper, it's a custom knife. Now, where do these fall in? Is it a full-on production knife? No. This is a production knife. Tad Gear Dauntless, fantastic knife, but it's a production knife. They can make thousands and thousands and thousands of these 
and all the parts are cut the exact same and they're assembled by who knows who and you know maybe the scales are, are made in one place and the tie frame lock is made somewhere else and the blade is made somewhere else and they're all just assembled in this big factory environment and that's not what these are here's how Joe breaks it down I'm gonna to try to condense it because he gave a very very long response but uh, what I'm repeating here is what he said first off he does all of the machining of the handles the clips the backspacers and the blades in-house mainly because he doesn't trust anyone else to run at the tolerances that he requires and he says honestly it would be far too expensive to have someone that's that good and pay them to do all of that work now what they do do is they send their four by eight four foot by eight foot titanium sheets out to water jet so the titanium starts out four foot by eight foot sends them out to water jet to get cut to a rough shape everything still has to be refined uh, thereafter then they have them perfectly ground flat by double disc sanding and it's very 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 precise that gives you flat and true that means you're starting off the, the proper way with all of your components now they've considered buying their own water jet and, and doing that in-house as well but he says honestly I don't see how the expense would benefit the customers and really there's no bragging rights to water jetting in-house versus sending out to a water jet company it's just not a a prestigious part of the knife making experience it's not a precision part of it either it's it's a very rough cut of what your final product will be later after you've refined it so does it matter if you did your own water jet or sent it out no not really so that's how he kind of feels about that now as far as heat treating goes that's another part that people uh, often worry about when it comes to am I getting a custom knife am I getting a mid tech knife production knife whatever by the way this is a 20 CV on this particular version M390 here this is about 75 of their blades they have of all the knives they've made uh, they have done their own heat treat he says honestly he goes the rest have gone out to Peters and Peters is the best they are the industry's leader in heat treating for knives they are the most precise they have the best possible equipment um, they do cryo they do everything and they do it properly and honestly there's nothing wrong with sending out for your heat treat if it's going to a place like you know Peters or Boz or something like that so they're using the best I've used Peters a lot for my heat treat because they are the best they are consistent and they're all going to be tested every single blade you get back it's going to have that little dimple in there. It was tested for its Rockwell hardness. So you know it's not a mystery. You know what you've gotten as a maker. So at the end, after all of this, Joe says, uh, he never really says honestly how he wants his knife to be classified. He simply states that without slapping a label on it, he runs through processes that most greatly benefit the customer for quality and value. So, Will we ever know how to properly classify it? Eh, I think it's going to be left up to your own determination. And the fact is, Joe doesn't care. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but he's making the best product that he knows how to make in the most efficient ways to lower the cost for the retail price and to provide uncompromising quality. And that's a really, really, really big deal. Because you got to realize these knives start, their base is $700, and they're nearly impossible to get. You're basically buying through lotteries, or if you make it to Blade Show, and I couldn't believe it, I stood there the morning, Friday morning, waiting for the customers to come in, and Joe and Andrew stand there in front of, I believe, about 150 knives on their table. I'm like, man, you guys are going to run a shit ton of lotteries. And she's like, nope. These are all first come, first serve. And that is so refreshing, especially for that hot in the moment knife, that hot in the moment maker, to not take advantage of doing everything as um, auctions or doing everything as lotteries, but to do first come, first serve. Let people run in the door and run in the door they did. Oh my God. People were fighting to get to the whole table and it was swamped. It was just swarmed with fans and new customers as well. 
and honestly that's what they really really wanted was for more people to get their hands on their knives so let's talk about some of what makes the Spectre special number one the ergonomics are really great it's a pretty straightforward knife it's not particularly crazy it's not like something like uh, like this it's not crazy and way out and it's it's a very simple EDC style knife but that clean design is really what most people have been attracted to it's beautiful feels really good in the hand nice pronounced finger choil he has relieved the presentation side so it's easier to reach the lock and having another knife in there does not let my camera focus I apologize so it's slightly more relieved here than it is on the back side so it's easier to disengage the lock just so sweet nice jimping on the spine not overdone there's the back spacer great fitment there is the uh, hidden hardware pocket clip which I love that it's just it's just so much nicer and cleaner uh, to, to not have a, a couple of big old screws hanging off there I love how it's been chamfered and shaped fits snugly beautifully it's in a nice pocket it's not going anywhere it's just a clean overall design but Joe has designed his pivot area inside that you can't really see here to be as strong as possible first off he's using quarter inch barrels uh, for the pivot he believes that using a traditional hidden stop pin uh, that'll have the uh, the moon or banana cut out in the blade he doesn't feel that strong enough because the stop pin is going to be press fit into the titanium and over time the battering of, of the blade being flipped open over and over and over uh, can loosen a stop pin in titanium because titanium is softer and you're hitting a, a piece of hardened steel he doesn't feel that's the strongest way to do it so what he's done is he has actually fit a stop pin into the blade so you have a steel stop pin hardened steel that is fit into the hardened steel blade and then there is a track system built into the titanium that allows that pin to glide and lock up perfectly every single time he feels that's a stronger again steel on steel contact is going to be stronger uh, you know common sense is really going to dictate that not that really you're going to be stabbing your specter into a tree and then standing on it however uh, it should be a lifelong setup you should never have to worry about replacing uh, any worn components or having anything sheared broken galled anything else with the way these are built and speaking of galling um, the adjustable detent is set up my goodness get out of the way the adjustable detent is set up as a uh, an integral design into the steel lock bar insert so you have steel on steel contact no galling between titanium and steel now let's talk about that detent it is an adjustable detent he's gone through a couple of different iterations of doing that so it allows the user to set their own detent strength maybe you like yours a little bit harder and sharper maybe you like yours a little bit softer and weaker that's entirely going to be up to you so it's integral into that whole little system that's built in right there and it's a rather ingenious little system and what it does is gives you a perfectly smooth knife with a snappy detent if you want a snappy detent the green one here is a little bit uh, softer on the detent because that's apparently how Alex likes his detents and you can adjust that all you want now I've shown you the smoothness of the action and that comes down to using caged bearings he has used steel bearings and ceramic but they're riding the uh, the pockets in the titanium have hardened and polished steel washers now this is a trick that's been utilized by the South Africans and many others for a long long time polish the surfaces that the bearings will engage and it will be smooth as glass but it's also a big deal to use those steel washers instead of just having the bearing pockets in the titanium 
Bearing pockets in titanium are pretty normal and, and really the, the way that most everybody makes their folders. But over time, those hardened steel bearings or those ceramic bearings will wear into the softer surface of the titanium. So by putting that steel spacer in there, now you have steel on steel or ceramic on steel. It's hardened steel. So they're going to be matched up in, into their hardness where it, one is not going to wear out the other. It's a very smart way of doing things. And that's the way that Joe seems to approach uh, every bit of his knife making is, uh, you know, kind of a common sense approach. Let's give you some close-ups here on the way out as best as I can. Let's see if we can get the camera to even focus. Oh, you're actually going to focus? Thanks. Nice clean blade finishes. They appear to be machine ground by looking at the plunges. I'm not exactly certain how they're doing their edges, but I'm going to assume it's something like a wicked edge, like a consumer sharpening system to get the, uh, the edges that they have on them. Focus. Thank you. Beautiful anodizing. Love the milled patterns that are done into these. And again, you can dictate, or uh, I don't want to say dictate because that's really for custom orders. Uh, you can select from different milled patterns in your titanium. Look at that color shift. So sexy. Beautiful pocket clip. Nice, clean, again, nothing crazy, and it works great. The ramp on the pocket clip allows it to go into the pocket super easy and holds it really, really well, but you don't, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have to strain to get it out of your pocket. Everything's clean. Hardware looks beautiful. Nice streamlined design all the way around. So, in my opinion, are these worth the money? Are they worth the hype? You know, it's really hard to say that. Uh, hype is hype. And these have absolutely been hyped. Are they worth $700? Yes. Are they worth $1,200, $1,300 with damage steel and things like that? Yes. You're just taking the knife that was already worth it at $700 and you're basically just adding in uh, the expense of damage steel and, and the additional polishing and work that goes into it. So, yes. I'm, I'm buying one myself. I'm at the point now, I mean, I, hey, I make my own knives, and also, being a knife maker, I don't have the budget that I used to to buy everything that I see whenever I want. I'm extremely selective about the knives that I buy, and this is one that I feel I have to have in my own collection. It's going to be useful for every type of cutting task I can think of. It's going to be easily carried uh, both in jeans or in lightweight uh, shorts. Hot days, cold days, doesn't matter. It's just one of those knives that, uh, again, you know, really like the Tad Dauntless. Uh, it's just great at everything. There's really no reason not to own one, not to love it, not to carry it. There are certain knives that I own that I love for various reasons, but they're not practical for every single day carry. This is one of those designs that I believe is. It's, it's in the vein of a Sebenza. There's not much that you'll ever need to do that a Sebenza won't do for you. There's not much that you're ever going to need to do that the Spectre is not going to do for you. And then you get to add in that that almost orgasmic feeling of the action. The, the beautiful sound of that detent just kind of going ka-ting as that blade breaks free. Hearing that very, very, very solid lockup, feeling no play in any direction. I mean, there is nothing anywhere what I'm doing here by the way you could test for the pivot play while the knife is locked and you can try and move it all around you can test for lock rock and all that but one of the things that some knife makers can do to cheat uh, is use their lock to make the pivot feel like it's more solid so if you unlock it and then you try to move it side to side that's where a lot of times you'll discover if a knife is really really good or not and these well, shit, they're really good. I can't really think of a downside to the knife. If I were to change maybe a couple of things, I'd love to see a hidden post lanyard post in here. I'd love to have the option to carry a lanyard if I wanted to. Uh, because there are people that love lanyards and some people that don't. And you don't want to take away from the design by putting a bunch of holes in it. Um, I would also like to see uh, more blind screws. 
Um, you know, they've blind screwed the clip. I'd love to see this hardware disappear as well. You know, just one of those things at this price range would be nice to see. Is it achievable at this price range? I don't know. I don't know how many hours are going into each of these knives. That may not be a practical request. I would, I like the fact that they are taking off the sharp edge of the spine, but I would love to see a crown spine on the, uh, on the blades. And that's it. I mean, and these are really just personal preferences. There may be people out there who go, no, I don't want a crown spine. Okay, so that's not necessarily an upgrade for you then. I get that. Uh, I, I really think the option of having a lanyard is perfect. And not having it uh, being obtrusive in the design for people that don't want to use a lanyard, I think is a good idea. And, uh, yeah, losing a little bit of the hardware would be cool. You know, just saying. Because it's such a clean, streamlined design. I'd like to see that. But that's it. I mean, you can sit around all day long and nitpick at any any made object and go, well, I would change this or I would do that. The fact of the matter is, this has gone through so much refinement. The knife is, I don't know, 98% perfect. I mean, there's really not much. And there's nothing that I would say, well, no, it doesn't have that or, it, or the screws are exposed. I'm not buying that. Oh, no. That's not where I'm at. I'm going to be spending my hard-earned money on this because I absolutely dig this knife. Is it the second coming? No. Are there better knives out there? Sure. Depends on how much money you want to spend and what your definition of better really is. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a knife that's as attractive with such high-quality materials, such fine precision in the uh, making of the knife, all this wrapped up into one, I think you'd be hard-pressed to do that. The Spectre is an absolute winner. Is it the second coming? Is it the greatest thing since sliced bread? No. But I don't think anybody is really trying to say that it is. A lot of people are going to want to compare it, and I'm going to do that right now. Hold on one second. A lot of people are going to want to compare it to its obvious competitor, another CNC knife. The Grimsmo Norseman. Well, here's the thing. The Norseman's bigger. It is slimmer, I will say that. But it's bigger and it's heavier. And some people don't like the blade shape. I'm one that does. I didn't like it at first. Did not like it at all at first. Uh, but it's an extremely practical blade shape. But here's the other great thing. If you were to buy a Norseman and there was anything about it that you weren't happy with, try sending it back to Canada. It's really hard with the Canadian import laws right now. You can't send a folding knife. If I have an issue with a Holt, I know it's very easily rectified. The prices are less on the Holt than they are on the Norseman. Not by a lot, but you know, a couple hundred bucks. A basic titanium, $900. A basic titanium, $7, $750. They obviously both go up from there. Just depends on what your personal preference is. If you like high end, custom, or mid tech, whatever you want to call these, CNC made knives that are made with passion and still great knife making skill, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anything in this price range in uh, this array of, of options and, and designs and colors all laid out in front of you. So, if you can find one, dude, get one. Seriously, you're absolutely going to love it. And you know what? If you hate it, everybody wants one right now. You've got amazing trade bait. <laughs> so, you can, if you go, ah, this ain't for me, you can easily trade it off into something else that is more you. All right, I have been long-winded enough, very, very long video. I wanted to put a lot into this because there really aren't any good videos at all about these knives out there that really give you all of the information, nobody talked to Joe and got this and got that, and I wanted to make sure their story was out there and we more clearly defined how they want their knives to be looked at and, and why they're special. So that's it for me. I'm out of here. I'm going to take the rest of the month off from making videos, most likely. I do have a flashlight video coming up. It is coming very, very soon on the Focus 
uh, Eric's light. It is coming, I promise. I said that in the last video, but it is coming. It's half done, so I'm going to take a break from making videos for a while since this one was so damn long. Let your friends know. Show them this. Show them how amazing these knives are, and if you own a Spectre, get out there and tell everybody about it. Well, you already do. You Honestly, y'all are like fucking vegans everybody's going to know that you've got a hold. So, uh, don't. You can stop. You're, you're doing a good enough job. But show everybody the video. Let them see just how beautiful these knives really are. And uh, hopefully, we'll see the new, yes, there's a new model called the Haptic coming out very, 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 very soon. I, I, I got to play with the prototype. It was pretty cool. Still like the Spectre more. But I think the Haptic's going to make people happy as well. All right, I'm out of here. See ya!